Welcome everybody to Pre-Health Shadowing. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-based, student-led, nonprofit organization focused on making shadowing opportunities readily accessible to pre-health students via our online um, platform during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, welcome everybody here today. We will be having one of our virtual shadowing sessions. A few things before we get started. Um, since pre-health shadowing uh, is virtual and allows students from not only places in the U.S. but all over the world to participate, go ahead and drop in the chat where you guys are zooming from today. It's always fun to see the connections that we can make. All right, so we do send out weekly emails at the beginning of the week with all of the shadowing sessions for that week with registration links and uh, the meeting ID for the Zoom. So if you guys are interested in keeping up and never missing a session, you can go to our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash join us and mark our emails as important inside your emails once you find that. You also wanna save prehealth shadowing as a contact and this just ensures that it'll bypass the junk, the spam and the promotions folder and go directly to your inbox where you can find it the most efficiently. We have closed captioning for all of our live sessions to accommodate students with disability. Parts of pre-health shadowing are trying to make shadowing accessible for all students. And so thank you for joining us on our journey as we do so. We have partnered with the women-led organization Mask for Mask, um, which serves to donate every four masks um, that are purchased. So for every four masks that are purchased, four masks will get donated to someone in need, whether it be um, a hospital that is lacking in resources or someone in the homeless community. Um, you guys can check out their website, maskformask.com. And they have a bunch of different designs. Um, this is something that you're probably gonna, you know, this is a need for everybody. So if you guys are interested in getting a mask, you can get 15% off your order if you use the code PHS15. You guys are supporting two good causes because not only do you donate four masks to someone in need, but you also are contributing 10% of all of your proceeds to pre-health shadowing to help keep our website up and free for all students. We have per, um, partnered with the Fem Health uh, Purpose Summit, which is a year long subscription to insider looks and networking opportunities to 19 founders, CEOs, and leaders in healthcare. These are um, some amazing women who have really um, made their mark in the healthcare field. Um, you know, one of these leaders was. Uh, is a multi-million dollar business owner who was on Shark Tank. So if you guys are interested in potentially, um, you know, kind of dipping your head into that, go ahead and sign up. If you go on our Instagram, in our link tree, you can find the Fem Health Purpose Summit. If you click our link, um, you can get this. Normally it is $50, but we were able to get it down to $29 for you guys. Use our link to sign up for this event. This is a year long subscription with the opportunity to gain some amazing insight from some amazing women. Alrighty, another cool perk about being with Pre-Health Shadowing is that we have um, some other uh, discounts for you guys. So we actually have some free resources that you can get from Kaplan. So if you sign up with Pre-Health Shadowing, um, put in your email to this link that was just dropped in the chat and you will receive um, free study guide resources. You will also receive a 10% coupon code to some Kaplan courses. Coming up very shortly, something to look forward to for the MCAT we are giving away a $2,500 scholarship to study for the MCAT. So um, check out our Instagram. Um, this will be posted within the next month. So that will be really exciting. Use our link in our link tree in our Instagram bio. If you are interested in getting published, Pre-Health Shadowing does now have opportunities for you all. You can submit articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories to the prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions page. And you will have the opportunity to get published. This is something that you can put on your resume, your application, your CV, your LinkedIn. Um, so it looks really awesome and you can really spread your insight. Alrighty, Pre-Health Shadowing is starting a student podcast. If you are interested in being a part of the student podcast team, you can actually sign up for it. Um, we're going to go ahead and drop that uh, link in the chat and you guys can um, interview with our head podcast, which is Anthony Castillo. And um, guys can start working on some things. It's really um, open to ideas. And so this is really something that you can be a monumental part of if you are interested. 
All right, and this is a QR code. I do invite all of my students here today to pull out their cell phones and go ahead and scan this code on your computer screen. This will take you to a page onto our website called the Donate page. So as Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-based, student-led nonprofit organization, we rely solely off of the contributions and support from our community to keep our um, opportunities and resources free for everybody. So we are working to fight inequity in health education and promote diversity in the various fields. So if you are financially able to donate at this time, we do encourage it. If you are not financially able, we encourage you to still scan this code, but instead of donating, please consider sharing it with someone who you think will be able to donate. That will make a very big impact on us so that we can keep our website up and free for all of the people who cannot afford it. If you are looking for a mentor, we do have some wonderful opportunities for that as well. Pre-Health Shadowing is hosting a mentorship networking weekend, which will be taking place on February 19 to 21. You will have the opportunity to meet with up to two established professionals per day, which means a total of up to six established professionals. You can not only connect with these awesome professionals, but you can also meet with like-minded students who are um, you know, potentially gonna be applying the same programs as you or have the same interests and specialties. Um, so this is by invite only. If you're interested in gaining an invitation to this event, there are a few easy steps. You can go ahead and click that link that will take you to the website that will outline all of this for you. But essentially, you are gonna download three photos from our Google Drive. You're gonna post them on your social media. When your bingo board is all filled up, you're gonna go ahead and submit it to our website and that's it. So if you guys are interested, uh, this is valued at $136 and you guys could get it for free. We do recommend um, this is due on January 31st. So sending out personalized messages um, individually to folks will definitely help you fundraise that money in time before the deadline. If you guys are interested, be sure to submit your bingo boards by January 31st at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you are interested in helping out with pre-health shadowing, as this is a student-based organization, you can. Um, you can sign up to become a volunteer, which is both asynchronous or hands-on on your own time. Um, you can also become a pre-health shadowing team member, which is a leadership position within pre-health shadowing. If you guys are interested, you can sign up on our website in the main menu under the contact tab. If you are a high schooler, we also have some opportunities for you as well. We now have our own high school um, team, which will be called HTP. You can apply through the same way that you would normally apply to be a team member through the team member application form. And in the tell us about yourself, go ahead and just add that you're interested in joining HTP. If you are joining us for our live session today, go ahead and share that on your social media for the opportunity to get reposted on our official page. Be sure to tag us at Pre-Health Shadowing and use the hashtag Pre-Health Shadowing. With Pre-Health Shadowing, students can take a post-shadowing assessment that, to receive a certificate that verifies their hours with us today. I encourage you guys to take some good notes and ask our professionals some wonderful questions. Feel free to drop those questions in the chat throughout the duration of the session, and we'll be sure to ask them during the Q&A portion. Without further ado, I would like to welcome to you our professional for today. Welcome, Dr. Lalani. It's a wonderful, wonderful to have you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Um, let me just make sure I have my presentation. Perfect. And students, while we are doing this, I do have a poll that is going to go out to you. You will have a few seconds to answer this, and then we'll go ahead and share it for everybody to take a look around the room. In quotes, a look around the room. <laughs> okay, let me make sure I'm set. Alrighty, we have about 75% of people voted. If you did not yet get your answer in, do so very quickly. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll in five seconds. Alrighty, go ahead and take a look around the room. We have a big group of pre-meds in here. <laughs> Alrighty, here is another question. All right, got about 
if you have not yet voted and you'd like to do so, go ahead and hit that submit button. Wonderful. All righty. Those are the results. And our very last question for you all today. A few more seconds. All righty. Wow, I guess we're gonna do some learning today. <laughs> <It's> exciting. <laughs> All right, the floor is yours, doctor. Great. Let me put this presentation up. Okay, so today I am gonna act like you guys are medical students with me on the hospital floor. What we're gonna do is we're, I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction to me, what I do, um, what internal medicine hospitalist as a field is, and then I'm gonna talk about my specialty palliative care and hospice. And then a really important subject I want to touch on is how to deal with a patient's death. So now I know this might be a touchy subject for some people, but it's very important to talk about this subject openly. What we're going to do is we are going to talk about a case. Um, you know, we're going to dissect the case. I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology behind what palliative care doctors do regarding pain management and other symptom management. And then we're also going to talk about the psychosocial aspect of it. And then in the end, I'm going to just give some advice to all pre-med students. Um, so before we begin, let me just review something. Okay, so a little bit about me. I am an internal medicine hospitalist. A hospitalist is a doctor that manages patients that are admitted into the hospital. So for example, let's say if someone comes in with chest pain to the hospital, the ER doctor sees the patient, and then the ER doctor calls me, the hospitalist, to admit the patient into the hospital. And what I do as a hospitalist is I coordinate care with different specialists. So if someone comes in with chest pain, I go evaluate this patient in the ED and I determine, okay, this is a real chest pain. This patient actually needs a workup. We need to make sure they're not having a heart attack. And then I admit them onto my service. So I see them from start to finish. And so when I admit them, you know, I get all their labs. I trend their troponin, which is this lab we look at to see if someone had a heart attack. And then I also coordinate care with a cardiologist who is the heart doctor. Um, so it's cool because as a hospitalist, you get to coordinate care with all different specialties. So you kind of get to do a little bit of everything. And then I am also a palliative care doctor. So most of my service is I do two to three weeks of internal medicine hospitalist, and I do one to two weeks of palliative care. Um, and I switch it around every month. During the pandemic, it's been mostly just hospitalist work with palliative care incorporated because there's just so much help that's needed being like an internal medicine hospitalist. So during the pandemic, um, I have been working at field hospitals and pop-up facilities. So I've been working at convention centers with limited resources and helping to treat COVID patients. A little bit about me, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I went to UT Austin for undergrad, and then I moved to New York City for medical school. I went to Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. And then I stayed here for residency. I did my residency with New York City Health and Hospitals in Brooklyn. And then I did my palliative care fellowship at NYU School of Medicine. Um, so I've been, been in New York for 10 years. So I'm officially a New Yorker. Um, I practice as a locums physician. So a locums doctor um, is a doctor that basically goes to areas um, all over the country where there's a shortage of doctors. So New York City is my base. And what I do is, you know, these companies hire me to travel to rural areas or any area of the country where there's a shortage of doctors. And so the reason I started doing this right when I, you know, graduated fellowship, I wanted to take a year or two to just give back. Um, I was initially thinking of doing some international work and in Doctors Without Borders, but when I started doing more research, I realized there's so many rural areas in America that have such a shortage of doctors um, and medical professions in general. And so I started looking more into it. And so what, how it works is that these companies hire me, you know, they pay for my, you know, air ticket and hotel, and, and then I go to these hospitals and 
you know, really rural areas of the country and I stay there for a week um, and then I see patients there and then I come back. During the pandemic, I've been mostly in New York City um, because I live here and, and, you know, the COVID really hit us bad. We were the epicenter. Um, and then last month, because I'm a travel doctor, I traveled to Texas um, to help with the surge of cases there. So I was at the convention center in El Paso, Texas, helping with, you know, the surge of cases there. So how the convention center works is that they set it up as a hospitals and you learn to work with limited resources to treat these patients. So it's, it's definitely been an incredible experience. I am back now in New York City working at the community hospitals here, seeing COVID patients that are admitted into the hospital as a hospitalist. I also do some media contribution. I've always been a very big proponent of public health and, and spreading public awareness of health issues. Um, so, you know, I write for magazine, I do some, you know, I do some podcasts, I go on the news, just talking about COVID and masking and all these, all these issues that are really pertinent right now. And I also believe in preventative medicine, which is basically treating the patient before the disease occurs. So making sure that, you know, we're very aggressive, for example, with diabetes, making sure, you know, the patient's eating healthy and, and taking the appropriate precautions so diabetes doesn't occur. So now I'm gonna go into the case. So how it's gonna work is like, I'm gonna discuss the case with you. I'm gonna present the case to you. So I'm gonna present this case as a palliative care doctor. Um, these are the type of cases we see on a usual basis. Um, and after I present the case, I'll talk about what palliative care and hospice is. But this case might be, um, you know, this is a heavy case, but I think it's very important to talk about this case openly because this is something you will see if you know you're considering medicine, especially someone that is dying, you know, death is a very taboo topic. But as a palliative care and hospice doctor, I take care of patients that are end of life or anyone with a chronic illness. So I think it's very important to talk about dealing with a patient's death openly. So this is the case. Mrs. Smith is a 45 year old female with stage four metastatic breast cancer. She is admitted to the hospital with severe pain in her hip, lower extremities, upper extremities, so like hands and legs, um, due to bone metastasis. So she has cancer that has metastasized to the bone. Her disease has progressed and she is more tired with decreased ambulation. So she's no longer able to move around as she used to. She follows with the oncologist, which is a cancer doctor, um, regularly and is currently not a candidate for chemotherapy due to progression of her disease. So basically her disease has gotten so severe that the oncologist needs to tell her that you know she's no longer going to be receiving chemotherapy. So you are consulted as a pain manage for pain management and goals of care. A little bit of social history about this patient. She is married, she has three children. She used to work as a biology teacher in high school and she is very involved in her church and community. And this is based on a true case. And this is a very type of, these are very type of common cases that I see as a palliative care doctor. So what is palliative care? So palliative care is a field of medicine that focuses on anyone with a chronic serious illness. So anyone with cancer, end stage heart disease, end stage lung disease, kidney disease, dementia, anyone with a chronic illness. And the goal of palliative care is to manage symptoms these patients might be having. So symptoms such as pain, difficulty breathing, um, nausea, vomiting. And, and what we do as palliative care doctors is we use different types of medications, especially being a physician, and based on the pathology and based on the pathophysiology of what the patient is feeling, you know, prescribe medications appropriately to make sure that their symptoms are managed. Uh, but we not only manage their symptoms, we also provide support to patients and families, and we help with any goals of care discussions these patients might need. Goals of care discussion means that let's say now, for example, this patient has metastatic cancer and is no longer chemotherapy, what steps would she want to take going forward? So we get to know the patient at a deeper level and based on her goals and wishes, give medical advice on things to do going forward. And we'll discuss all of that. Um, I work in a team, I work in a multidisciplinary team. So one of the best parts about my field is that I have a 
an incredible team of people I work with. So it's not just me, the physician. I also work with a nurse practitioner. I, I also work with palliative care nurses, um, social workers, um, and chaplains. So that's like a big part of my team. And all of us get together and help manage patients' physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Uh, palliative care is appropriate at any age um, and at any stage of the serious illness, and it can be provided along with curative treatment, which means that if someone is diagnosed with metastatic cancer and they're still getting chemotherapy, we can still get involved. Hospice, on the other hand, is for anyone that has a life expectancy of six months or less. So palliative care is for anyone with a chronic illness. You know, they, they don't need to have a prognosis of six months or less. Um, it could be anyone with heart failure, dementia, um, that, that needs symptom management. Hospice, on the other hand, you have to have a life expectancy of six months or less. Uh, people often think of hospice as a place someone goes to, but it's actually a service that is provided. Um, it could be anywhere. It could be at someone's home, which is the ideal place most patients like to be, um, or it could be a nursing home, or it could be in the hospital itself. So as a hospice doctor, I also make house calls. So I go into patient's home and, you know, especially if they're actively dying, I'm by their bedsides, making sure that, you know, they're comfortable, making sure that their symptoms are managed. Um, and, and that's a very rewarding part of my job because, you know, not a lot of doctors go visit patients at home anymore. And with home hospice, this is something you get to do. Um, and the goal is to make sure that they're comfortable. Um, and ideally, most patients like to die at home. So again, it, it, hospice is for anyone that has life expectancy of six months or less. Palliative care is for anyone with a chronic illness. So the interdisciplinary team, again, has a physician, me, who manages like the medical side of things, you know, getting to know the patient's disease, the disease progression, make a prognosis, how long does this patient really have to live? Um, but I also work with the nurse, especially in the hospice setting. The nurses have played such a big role because they're the ones sometimes I go into patients' home um, multiple times a week um, because I'm not able to go into the patient's home because I'm sometimes managing like hundreds of patients at one time. So it's actually the nurse that's going into the patient's home and then they give me a call and they're like, hey, this is the symptoms patient's having or patient is stable. We also work with nurse practitioners, social workers, which are a big part of our team, um, chaplains, because spiritual care is just as important as, you know, emotional and physical care, and then therapists and grief counselors. So the way palliative care and hospice works is we believe in a mind, body, and soul approach. Um, so for this patient example, you know, she came in with pain. So, you know, our job would be pain and symptom management, but she is also a mother and also a biology teacher. And, and that's like the human side of her. Um, so we also address the psychosocial side of things. You know, she might need help telling her children that she has metastatic disease and she can no longer work or, you know, she might be dying and, and that's something we help it. And then religious as well, you know, this patient was, you know, like I said, in my case, um, was Christian and then church was a big part of her life. And it's so important to address, you know, all aspects of her being a human being um, to, to deny her, you know, religion or her social side of things can, can actually cause a lot of issues. So when you're looking at these patients, one of the best parts about my field is that, you know, I'm not just looking at her for pain. I'm making sure she doesn't have any psychosocial pain, doesn't have any, you know, some, you know, making sure that, you know, whatever issues that she has is managed in a holistic manner and not, we're not just seeing tunnel vision. We're looking at the human as a whole. And so the case again, 45 year old female, stage four metastatic breast cancer comes in with pain in her hip and lower and upper, upper extremity. Her disease has progressed. She's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. She follows with an oncologist, but the oncologist now has to tell her that he's not gonna be offering chemotherapy. You are consulted for pain management and goals of care. Social again, she's married, three children. She's a biology teacher. She's very involved in her church. So pain management. So pain management is a very big part of what I do. And a lot of pain that I manage is cancer related pain. Um, so when I'm looking at this patient, when I'm going into this patient's room, there are a few things that are going through my head. 
the most important thing I need to do is get a very detailed pain history. I cannot talk to her about, you know, how she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy or any other discussions unless I'm able to manage her pain appropriately. And it's also the humane thing to do um, because cancer pain can be very painful. And so when I'm going to write the room, my first thought process is like, okay, before I talk to her about anything, I need to make sure her pain is appropriately managed so she's able to participate in complex discussions with me. And so when we look at the pain, you know, when I go in to ask our questions, I'm thinking, you know, one of the mnemonics I use is PQRST. So first I'm asking her, you know, where is the pain located? What's the quality of your pain? Is it gnawing? Is it, um, is it burning type of pain? Um, is there anything that can get, makes it better? Is there anything that makes it worse? Um, you know, what, what medications have you taken already? She, you know, she might say, I've already taken Tylenol and ibuprofen and it hasn't helped. And then I ask her, is there anything that get, makes it better? Um, and, and the cool thing about pain, the way pain works is that let's say if you have a cut. So what happens is that this, this cut that you have, there are these pain, channel, pain channels in your body uh, that, are, that are sending signals to your brain and targeting these receptors in your brain that tell your brain that you are in pain and that you're having actual pain. So the goal of treatment with opioids, for example, morphine, is to target these receptors in your brain. So you, you basically cut off the, the receptor signal. And, and that's how basically the concept of pain management works. So it's kind of cool that there are these like pain receptors in your body that target your brain telling them, hey, you have a cut, you're in pain. And then the opioids try to target these specific receptors. Um, so there are different types of pain. There's somatic pain, which is pain that occurs when uh, pain receptors or tissues are damaged. For example, you know, muscle pain, skeletal pain, joint pain, um, and typically stimuli such as force, temperature, vibration, and swelling activates these receptors. Um, this type of pain is often described as cramping and gnawing. That's why getting a pain history is so important. Um, the other type of pain is nociceptive pain, which is just a medical term used to describe pain from physical damage. Um, for example, sports injury, dental procedures, arthritis, and there's neuropathic type of pain. So neuropathic type of pain is usually when there's damage to the nerves. And this, some, this is something we usually see with, um, like, for example, diabetic nerve pain. And, and, and it's usually described as burning and tingling. And the medications we use to, to treat neuropathic type of pain is different from the medications we use to treat somatic nociceptive type of pain. That's why getting a pain history is just so important because I need to know what medications to use and what receptors to target to, to get the optimal results. And so for this patient, she's having bone pain, which is likely somatic nociceptive bone type of pain. And the treatment I would use for her is opioids. Um, so there are different type of opioids. I know opioids have a bad rep, but you know opioids were created to manage these type of pains, pains from cancer, pains um, from you know very severe chronic diseases, um, and 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 they're, they're they can be good. They can help patients and and make sure they're able to live their lives to the best of their abilities. Um, so there are different types of opioids. There's morphine, oxycodone, dilaudid, fentanyl. And in my head, I would, before I would even see her, I would be reviewing her labs. I would review her labs. I would review her kidney function. I would review her liver function. And based on her kidney function and liver function, I would decide what type of opioid to use. Um, for example, if she's in kidney failure, I would not be using morphine, I would go towards more dilaudid. Um, if she has liver failure, I would avoid certain medications. And then along with you know, prescribing her opioids, I would also be giving her stool softeners and checking for side effects. The most common side effects patients have actually with opioids are, is constipation. So I would be writing you know, a prescription for stool softener along with the opioid. And some other common side effect of opioids are nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, um, and then there's also other pain management modalities that we would do, you know, depending on how many lesions she has, maybe she would be a candidate for radiation therapy. And, and so there's all these like multifacet therapies that we would use to make sure she's comfortable with her pain. 
Um, so next I want to move on to the psychosocial aspect of things. So first we address the pain and now we're going to order, you know, now we're going to go towards the psychosocial aspect. So for her, she has three children. She is currently married. And so providing support to the children and family is also a big part of our job. I would get the social worker involved that would be on my team to see, you know, is there anything this patient needs regarding talking to, to her children, talking to her spouse, any additional help she needs at home, whether it is, you know, increasing our home health data hours or, you know, any, any help she needs with children and, and, and family members she can contact. Um, she's also a biology teacher. Do we need to call her work? Do we need to, you know, so there's so many things that are involved. And that's why it's so important to have a social worker on our team that manages the psychosocial aspect of things. And we all work in a team together. So every morning we meet um, and, and, you know, all of us are in the room together and we discuss these patients in details to see the best way we can help them. And then the spiritual side of things, you know, she is Christian, um, faith is a big important and part of her life. So I would also get our palliative care chaplain involved. Um, and our palliative care chaplains are just so incredible. You know, it's not just they're, they're for any religion, you know, and then our palliative care chaplain can also contact other um, faith-based leaders if needed. So let's say if someone has, you know, one of our, if let's say if our patient is Muslim or if the patient is Jewish or Buddhist, like whoever the patient needs from our community that, you know, we need to contact to get them involved because spirituality is a very big part of um, patients' lives. And it's important that we also address that, that aspect of it and not just, you know, the medical side of things uh, because what makes, humans so complex is that we're not just you know one thing we're, we're it's a bunch of things together that we need to focus on to help this patient so changing gears you know like i discussed earlier in the case she is no longer a candidate for chemotherapy so now you know i would be getting with the oncologist to kind of tell her that she is no longer going to be a candidate for chemotherapy. And, and that's very difficult. You know, this is a very bad news I'm about to break to her. And so a big part of our palliative care training is being really good at communicating these bad news to patients. And, and it's never easy. It's a, it's a very tough part of my job. Um, but, but there are these protocols that we have in place to kind of help us with these conversations. So one of the protocols I use is a spikes protocol. So let's say, you know, this patient is in her room. I'm there with the oncologist and the family. And now I'm going to tell the family and the patient that she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. So what I use is I use a spikes protocol. So first, what I would do is setting. S is for setting. So I would make sure it's a very comfortable environment. I would make sure that all the family members have a chair and, and they're sitting. Um, you know, there's no noise in the background. The TV is not on. You know, Jerry Springer is not playing on the TV. It's just like a very nice environment where all of us can discuss things comfortably. And then I would, you know, be there with the oncologist and the primary team, the hospitalist, which would sometimes be me. Um, and then I would ask her, what's your perception of what you think is going on? Um, so P is for perception. So in her case, she would say, you know, I have metastatic, you know, breast cancer. I'm here because I have pain in my hip and my lower and upper extremities. And that's why I'm admitted because my pain is so severe. And currently I'm on chemotherapy. And then I would ask her, I is for invitation, um, how do you want the, do you, how do you want to receive information? There are times sometimes patients will say that, you know, if there's any bad news, I don't want to know, talk to my eldest son. You know, there are definitely cultural differences that go into play with some of these patients. It's so important to be respectful of that. And so the patient might say, I don't want to hear anything bad, just talk to my family. Or she might say, you know, I, I, I want to receive all the information. And it's so important to ask them how to get this information. And then K is for knowledge. This is where I would, you know, explain to her what the oncologist and I are thinking. So, you know, I would tell her in this step that, you know, she's no, because of the disease progression and how bad the disease has progressed, she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. 
And then E is for emotions. After I give this news, I am just gonna back off and make sure that she is able to really process this and really be there for her. And, and to me, that's the most important step, you know, to be able to just be there for the patient and the family, whether she's crying or whether she's in disbelief. I want the patient to know that even though she is no longer going to be getting chemotherapy, we are not going to stop caring for her. We are still going to be caring for her. We're still going to be supporting her and her family. We're still going to be managing her symptoms. We're going to make sure that she's as comfortable as possible. And then S is for summary. Then I would, you know, summarize again, like, you know, I would ask her, okay, so could you just give us a recap of what we just discussed? I just want to make sure that she really understood what I was telling her and the information I was giving her. And then I would move on to the goals of care part of things. So then I would ask her, you know, now that you are no longer a candidate for chemotherapy, I, I want to know what your goals and wishes are. You know, do you want CPR or would you want to go naturally? A lot of patients will say, you know, especially if it's a 95 year old that has, you know, metastatic cancer, sometimes they would say, you know, I lived my life when my heart stops, I would want to go naturally. Um, some people say, you know, I want every, I want CPR, even though I know my chance of survival is very little, I still want it. Um, it it's, you know, in line with my religious beliefs. And this is what I would want going forward. And then we would respect their wishes. You know, our job is not to change their mind. Our, our job is to really speak to them about what their wishes are so we can properly document it and, and carry on their wishes. And then we would ask, okay, would you want to be intubated if your lungs fail? Um, some patients say, I wouldn't want to be intubated for a long time. I would want it to, to be intubated for a couple of days and then you reevaluate me. So it's never just black and white. It's, it's a very detailed conversation we have to really get to know, you know what, what's your goal. If someone is very independent and they would never want to be dependent on people, then that's something we have to discuss. You know, There's a probability after they have CPR, they're not gonna go back to what they were. Is this a life you're willing to live with? So these are very tough conversations. They're not just held like this. You know, it, there's a lot that goes into play um, and it takes time to build these relationships and talk to them so openly about it. So now we're gonna talk about, you know, dealing with a patient's death. And, and I think this is very important to discuss because no matter what field of medicine you go into, um, if you are a resident or even if you go into nursing or nurse practitioner or PA, there will be a time where you deal with the patient's death. So it's so important to talk about this. So you are a resident on call and you are notified at night that Mrs. Smith has died at 2 a.m. You are called to pronounce her and do a death exam. So before you go to see her, it's very important you check the resuscitation status. If she is full code, which means she wants CPR, you would perform the CPR. In her case, we're gonna say that she's DNR, DNI, which means that when her heart stops, she wants to go naturally. So you wanna make sure they're not doing CPR on someone that's DNR. Um, and so then you also want to review the patient's note quickly or at least get a sign out on why she's here. You know, it's Mrs. Smith, she's here for metastatic breast cancer and, and she, this is why she died or what's going on. So you always wanna review the medical history because you don't wanna walk into a patient's room and have no idea what her name is even, you know? Um, so you wanna have a little bit of background. And then also the circumstances surrounding her death for this case with metastatic cancer. Um, if there are any family or friends around, you also want to introduce yourself before going into the room. You want to be aware that this is someone's wife or someone's mother that just died and you want to be mindful of that and be very respectful of family members. You don't want to be rude. You always want to be humble and you always want to be kind. You know, dealing with someone's death is not easy. So before you walk into the room, acknowledge the patient's family and then, then you will perform a death exam. So before you, you perform the death exam, before walking into the room, you wanna make sure you have the proper PPE on, especially in COVID era. Um, you wanna confirm the patient's identity by checking her wristband. Uh, you wanna look for obvious signs of life, like, you know, is she having any respiratory effort? Um, are there any movements you're seeing? You wanna call the patient, you wanna say, hello, Mrs. Smith, can you hear me? I am here. Uh, 
And then you want to assess her pain, you know, stimuli to pain. You want to assess her pupillary reflex, reflex uh, with a pen or torch. Usually after death, people tend to have fixed dilated pupils. They're called doll's eyes. Um, you also want to palpate her carotid artery and listen to her heart sounds and lung sounds with your stethoscope to make sure everything's okay. A lot of times we get a rhythm strip where, you know, we look at the monitor to make sure it's a flat line, which is called an asystole. And then, you know, sometimes in ICU setting, if they're brain dead patients, we also do these apnea tests and do all these things to confirm um, that the patient has died. So death is a normal part of life, but doesn't make it any easier. Seeing a patient die is something everyone will experience, whether you're a med student, resident, nurse, physician, or any other medical provider. Um, and, and, you know, it's the human, human side of medicine. Um, and it's really important to express your emotions. So you will get close to your fellow med students, your fellow residents. Um, and especially if you got close to the patient, you want to make sure that you let yourself feel the loss. You know, you're a human being and you just saw another human being die and, and that's not always easy. So make sure you talk to your colleagues and, and you know, your attending physicians about what you are going through. Um, you know, especially you will start developing long-term relationships and, and, and it's okay to talk to your colleagues and other doctors and attendings openly about your feelings. You know, a lot of times, sometimes, you know, especially as a palliative care doctor, I, I've been seeing these patients since the time they're diagnosed with cancer and I get to know them for six months. I'm seeing them on a regular basis and then they die. And, and I always communicate openly my feelings with my colleagues. I tell them, you know, that, you know, that was really hard for me because she, she was married, she had children, that was really hard. I can't imagine what her family is going through. Um, and it's just so important to express your emotions openly. Also take some time to reflect, you know, everyone deals with patient loss in their own way. Uh, one of the recommendations for books I have is called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. And it just touches on this subject, you know, as a, as a medical provider, no matter what field you go into, it's important to also, we're not just read like the biology and pathophysiology of things, but also to read about the human side of medicine and, and, and why it's so special what we do you know, and, and it's not just biology. Dispel any feelings of failure. You can't control if someone gets metastatic cancer or any other chronic illness. It's not your fault that the patient died. And it's really important to understand that. It's really important to, for you to comprehend that you did everything you can in your power. Um, and, and this is just, you know, what happens. You know, everyone dies. I'm going to die one day. You're all going to die. And everyone we know is going to die and it's a part of life, uh, but it's also important to process it in a healthy manner. Now, obviously, if things get hard, speak to a licensed therapist. If you start feeling like, you know, this patient's death is impacting your mental health, you're unable to sleep, you're unable to eat every time you see a patient or it gives you PTSD of what you went through, it's really important to talk to a licensed therapist and get help because you won't be able to treat your future patients appropriately if you're not really dealing with your own mental health. And then now we're just going to switch gears and talk about advice to med for medical school. Um, so I think one of the most important things to do is get a mentor and shadow doctors like these shad shadowing sessions. Um, you truly don't know if you want to do something till you actually do it. So when I was in college, I remember, you know, getting involved in organizations like these or other organization that gave me um, shadowing opportunities to shadow physicians. And I know that's hard currently due to the pandemic. And I'm pretty sure when you apply to med schools, they're going to be um, understanding about that. You know, I'm not able to accept any students to shadow me because I don't, I want to make sure they're not getting COVID and, and, you know, getting really sick. So these type of uh, programs that are out there are really important to just kind of listen to other doctors about their experience, what they see, what they do, um, to really see if something, it's something you want to pursue. And then also volunteer, you know, all of us go into medicine to help people. So you want to make sure you're, you're showing that you're showing that you know, you are willing to help other people and not get paid for it. And, and it's something you genuinely enjoy to do. Um, study early, apply early. I 
I'm a big believer in this. I applied to med school right when the portal opened up. Even before the portal opens up, it allows you to upload your rec letters. It allows you to upload your personal statements. So you really want to make sure you're on top of it. And that's something, you know, being being early and being on top of things is something you will have to, is a, it's a very important skill to learn just being a physician or any other medical profession in general. You know, most of us physicians have to be organized, have to be on top of things. And, and this is just early practice. So you want to make sure that even before the portal opens up, you know, you've started uploading your documents uh, and, and you're just on top of it. And then also get involved in extracurricular activities that are not related to medicine. You know, there are so many different clubs, you know, anything you like, whether it's music or arts, you know, just get involved in other things. People like seeing people that are different and are involved in other um, organizations and activities, not just in medicine. It makes you more well-rounded. And then most importantly, be humble, be kind to patients. You know, the best doctors I've met are not just smart, but they're also just genuinely really good people. They always want to help patients. They care for their patients. They're so empathetic towards patients. And, and that's what truly makes a good physician. It's not just your medical knowledge. It's also how you treat people and how you treat your patients. Um, so always be humble. And that's it. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. And I absolutely love the case study. I think that's something we haven't had in a lot of these sessions. So I go to walk through a case study like that. So I think that was a really great opportunity for our students. Um, if you don't mind, we can go ahead and jump into the Q&A if you're ready. Sure. Okay, first question is, um, why did you decide to become a local physician? Is it because of the way wanting to travel and how do you cope with that and having a family? So I decided to locum, did you ask me about locums physician, right? Yeah. So I decided to locums is because it gives me so much flexibility. So because I work through some, instead of working at an institution where a lot of people, so a hospital schedule is seven on, seven off. So it's shift work. It's kind of like what the emergency doctors do. So you work 12 to 12 and a half hour shifts, seven days straight and then you have a week off and then you work seven days straight so that is already a great schedule for a lot of people um, you know that's different for let's say if you do internal medicine go into the clinic side of things where your hours are going to be mostly nine to five so when you are in training you will you know rotate with all these doctors and it will help you kind of decide do you want to go towards more inpatient side of things or do you want to be outpatient let's say if you're a consultant so when i'm a palliative care consultant and not the hospitalist my hours are usually Monday through Friday, like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, you know, everything differs. I decided to do locums because I wanted to do rural medicine, but it's not just rural places. You can go to any city. Um, they also tend to pay you more and you also have more flexibility. So because of, you know, I have, I have my specialty, it allows me to be more flexible. So I can say, I want to work these two weeks, you know, at this hospital. And then I want to take two, three weeks off. And locums allows you to do that because you don't have a straight contract with just one hospital. So you can be one week at one hospital, one week at another hospital, and then not work for a month because you're not contracted at a facility. So just a lot that having that flexibility is something that was very appealing to me. Uh, but I also tend to go towards rural areas because I feel like it's very rewarding to go to these rural areas. It's not something, I don't know if I'll be able to do locums long-term when I have children. I currently don't have any children. So, you know, I definitely have more flexibility. I, you know, I don't think when I have children, I'll just be able to go away for like two, two weeks straight or one week straight and then come back. There are physicians that do do that, um, that have proper support, but uh, I don't know if it's something I'd be able to do long-term. And when that time comes, I'm possibly gonna just be at a hospital um, you know, at one hospital, whether it's in New York or wherever I end up um, and, and do like the seven on seven off shift type work. Thank you. Um, a little something that's related to that, what would you say the most interesting hospital or place you've traveled to um, as being a local physician and what, we were, what was your experience with that? Yeah, so I traveled to, uh, so, 
actually I've lived in New York for 10 years and I didn't realize there are actually so many areas in upstate New York that are pretty rural next to the Canada border. Uh, so I was at in this small town called Corning, New York, and it's pretty rural um, next to Canada border. And, and it was just so wonderful just meeting people from these rural areas. And, and, you know, you, it makes you realize how connected we truly are and we're more similar than different. And you kind of go into these rural areas with these preconceived notions of how people will be or how things will be and the complete opposite of what they actually are. You know, people are so kind and, and they're so generous and they're just so thankful for you to be there. So I, I don't think I could pick one place. There's just so many areas I've gone to. I've gone to Ozark, Missouri, you know, which is pretty rural. Um, you know, certain areas of Texas can be rural. So all states have areas that are considered rural. Thank you. So how do you navigate patients with different psychosocial backgrounds than you or a different religion and different traditions, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's why it's so important that as a as a palliative care physician, I work in an interdisciplinary team. So it's not just me seeing the patient, it is also my chaplain, my social worker, my nurse practitioner, my nurse, and we all truly go in as a team. So I might go in first, making sure, you know, the pain is controlled. And then I, you know, I discuss the case with my chaplain and the chaplain goes in, sees the patient, depending on what their religious background is, you know, contacts other spiritual leaders, or if he's able to help, you know, assist, in aiding any spiritual needs this patient has. So, so the way I'm able to manage is because I work in a team. It's never something I could do alone. And that's why it's so important to be part of this team. And it's so rewarding to be part of this team because we're all in it together. Yeah, I definitely think that speaks to the fact of why it's so important to increase diversity in the healthcare field and just hear from different experiences. Definitely. Um, so another question that was asked a lot was, how did you know that internal medicine was your calling as a career? Yeah, that's a great question too. So when I was in medical school, I did, one of the great things when you will do your rotations in med school is you will figure out what you like, but you'll also figure out what you don't like. So when I was in medical school doing my rotations, I went and thinking, oh, I would want to do like surgery or ob gyn and did my surgery rotation. I was like, nope, this is not something I want to do. Um, and, you know, I did my ob gyn rotation. I was like, no, I kind of don't like the hours. Um, and what I loved about internal medicine is that it, there's so many specialties you can go into um, and you can't do that with, you know, um, other specialties in medicine. Like, obviously, if you go into surgery, there's different specialties of surgery you can go into. But if you don't want to do surgery, you know, most people go into internal medicine because you can go you know, after you do your internal medicine residency, which is three years, you can either go into, you know, pulmonology, which is the lung doctor, cardiology, which is the heart doctor, rheumatology, which is like the bone doctor, um, endocrine, which is like, you know, the thyroid and diabetes doctor, you um, there's just so many specialties that you can go into it. And I loved knowing that there's so many options I can pursue. And then you do fellowships, which is like further training in these specialties. Uh, and, and that's why I picked internal medicine, just because the vast specialty choices you have. So what made you want to pursue palliative care and hospice is, as your specialty in internal medicine, despite, especially despite like the grim outcomes of often have occur for patients? Um, so when I went, when I was doing my, in, so when you do your internal medicine residency, you also rotate through different specialties to kind of, you know, just like what you do in medical school, it's also what you do in residency. So you work with different doctors, you shadow them, you learn with them, and then it, you kind of realize, okay, you know, when you're shadowing a cardiologist, is this something you want to pursue long-term? Do you want to be a cardiologist? And then everyone gets like, you know, navigated and attracted towards a field. And one of the things I liked when I was in residency was that I always liked spending time with patients. I always liked talking to family members, um, always liked having these goals of care discussions. And I liked pain management aspect of things, especially for cancer patients. Um, so, and then when I was dealing with these really sick patients that were end of life or had chronic illness. I, I, I knew I, I, I just felt like it was very rewarding. And I knew that was a patient population I wanted to work with. It's not easy. Not everyone goes into it, obviously, because it's a very um, emotionally charged and hard field. Um, but it was just something I knew was a good fit for me. 
Great. And these are also really great questions. If you guys have more questions, you know, after we're done with this session, please feel to reach out to me on my Instagram. I usually, you know, try to answer as many questions as possible on it. I might not reach back to you right away, but I always try to answer as many questions as possible for all medical students. It's it should be attached to like the poster. So it's dr.lalani. I'm going to share it. Um, thank you so, so much you for that offer. Know. That is so very kind of you. Uh, we do have somebody in the room who has their hand raised. Fatima, if you want to um, ask a question. Yeah. So hi, Dr. Shaneen. My question, I'm really curious about this. If you were on the um, medical admissions team, personally for you, what would impress you? You have the advice, you know, on the screen, but I want to know what would stand out for you. So I think different things stand up, stand out for different people. I wish there was a formula that I could master because then I would be very rich because I could give all these advice to people about exactly what to do. Uh, so it is really not one size fit all. You know, obviously it matters. You know, your grades matter, but do you need to have a 4.0? No, I didn't have a 4.0. Um, your, your scores matter, but does that mean you need the perfect score? No, you know, you might have, a, you might interview well, you might have great extracurricular activities, um, you might have something different about you that they like. So there truly is no formula. But one of the things people universally look at is making sure that, you know, you how you volunteer, you're doing things that are that, that are sparking your interests in medicine, um, you, you're well rounded, you're involved in extracurricular activities, um, and, and just like how you are as an overall person, and, and it really shows when you're applying, you know, so it's truly not one size fit all don't get discouraged if you don't have the highest grades or like the best GPA, that does not mean you will not get in. Um, and, and, and honestly, the first step is usually just go ahead and apply, you know, you never know, even if you have low scores, or I mean, not super low, but if, if you have like average scores, and average grades, you just never know, if it might work or not. So just always go ahead and apply, you have to believe in yourself. I felt like when I was applying, a lot of people were like, Oh, well, med school is so hard to get into. And, 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 you know, how will you do it? And, and how will you get through it? And, and a lot of people don't even apply. So I think it's just one of the advice I always give to people is just like, just do it, just go ahead and do it. Cause when you do it the first time, then you'll know, you know, if you apply the second time, you'll know, okay, maybe this is what I would have done differently. This is something I need to add. Maybe I need to do a little bit more research. This is what's missing. So that's just, that's just what I would say to that. Thank you. I think it's so important to also remember that like there's no set timeline for anything. Everyone's life right. is completely different and our journeys can take different paths. Um, so I'd like to invite participants, if you do have a question you want to ask directly, um, go ahead and raise your hand and I will let you do that. Um, but for now, we'll go off some more of the questions that were in the chat earlier. Um, so one question is, what, is there anything that encouraged or inspires you to choose osteopathic medicine over allopathic? And what have your experiences been um, having gone to an osteopathic school? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, especially DOs have been in the news a lot and there's some very preconceived notions and wrong notions about what it is. So when I applied to both schools, I applied to DO schools and I applied to MD schools. When I was applying 12, 15 years ago, um, you know, it was easier probably for me to get into MD school if I just stayed in Texas because I went to school there and I was a resident there and there's a few medical schools in Texas, but I knew I wanted to get out of Texas. I wanted to move to New York. It's something I always wanted because I knew I wanted to be in a big city. I knew the, the, just like the patient population I would see would be so different than anywhere else. Um, and I wanted to just move to a fun city and not and Texas is a lot of fun. I grew up there, you know, I, I, it's still my home. I still go visit my parents, but New York city is my home now. Um, and, and I wanted to move. So when I was applying, the location was something I wanted to look at, you know, and, and I didn't get into any MD schools in New York, but I did get into the DO school. And, and when I interviewed there, I just knew it was a good fit. You know, when I was meeting with the professors there, it was just, we were just vibing. I just knew it was like, I liked the location. I liked that I could live in the city. Um, 
And then when I started my med school and, and I actually met people in my class, we we just fit so well, you know, they became my close friends and some of them are still my close friends. Um, and so it truly depends on what you're looking for. The only difference with a DO school compared to an MD school is that you learn more of the osteopathic side of things where you're learning the human anatomy more deeply. You're learning about um, what we call OMM, and that's going to be about like 10 to 15 to 25% of your curriculum, uh, but everything else is the same. So, you know, you're still applying to the same residencies, the same fellowships. And, and I think now more than ever, it truly doesn't matter which school you go to. Uh, in the end, you want to pick a school that's a good fit for you based on things that are important to you. Thank you. Um we had some students wondering what undergraduate degree did you um, pursue at that once you got out of high school and how did you make that decision? So um, for my undergrad, I was a psychology major because I just loved psychology. I really genuinely enjoyed it. Um, and then I was a business minor and then I was pre-med. So the way pre-med works is that you there are these classes you have to take to apply to medical school. You know, they'll say that you need this many biology classes, this many chemistry classes, this many organic chemistry classes. This is what you need to take. So once you take those classes, you could be any major. You know, you could be psych pre-med, you could be business pre-med, you could be engineering pre-med. So it really doesn't matter what your major is. You want to major in something that makes you happy. And so I liked psychology and I liked business. So I minored in business. So Technically, I was a psych major, and then I had psych pre-med, and then I was a business minor. So you're able to really combine different specialties if you want, um, major-wise. So it really doesn't matter what you major in, you know? You, and if you truly love biology, you can always major in biology, because I feel like a lot of pre-meds do that. But you don't have to. You can be different majors. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that a lot as somebody who is not a traditional biology major. <laughs> So I think that's really great. Um, okay, changing topics a little bit, a um, little heavier. Um, has anyone ever changed their mind about what they would like for their end of life plan? And if, or perhaps due to conversations they've had with you, and if so, what has your experience been with that? Yeah, people change minds all the time, actually. And then that's completely okay. Our job is not to change their mind. Our job is to make sure that whatever wishes they have are carried out as they would like. So for example, someone could be like, you know, when I'm dying, when that time comes and if my heart stops, I would want to go naturally and I wouldn't want CPR. There are times, you know, in the moment or, a, you know, few months down the line, the patient's like, you know what, I actually do want CPR. I've spoken to my religious leader, I've spoken to my family, and this is something that I need to do um, so they could have a peace of mind. And, and that's fine too. People are allowed to change their mind. This is their lives. Our job is just to kind of be there supporting them and making sure whatever wishes they have are carried out. Thank you. Um, what strategies do you use to prevent some of your emotions from interfering with your work, um, especially when you're dealing with somebody who is actively dying? Yeah, so you know that's one of that's one of the big reasons not everyone goes into this field. You have to be, you know, mentally um, and in general overall, you have to have some form of stability. So I do mindfulness. I do, you know meditation. I have a very active social life. I have a great partner who's always there for me. Um, I have a great friend circle that's always there for me. I'm always talking about, you know, things that are very tough for me. I'm able to communicate that to them easily. So if you're someone that can't handle, you know, these intense cases all the time, then it might not be the feel for you. But, but you know, in general, like everything, whether you're in med school or residence, you learn ways to cope with it in a healthy manner. You know, you when you're going to be in medical school or in residency, you'll realize you're working so much and you're studying so much. And then you find healthy coping strategies. You'll see that, oh, like going out with your friends to night out is, you know, something that benefits you and it helps you. So it's something you'll enjoy doing, you know, as long as you're not like binge drinking or something, you know, you're doing something in like a 
happy manner <laughs> or you know just like going for a hike or or doing things that just kind of add to your life positively is something I usually do thank you um can you speak about a little bit about the first time that you did lose a patient and what was it like and how did you cope how you coped with that specifically and what you've learned from it as you progressed in the field um did you ask the first time I saw I dealt with a patient's death yes sorry so that was definitely in medical school. I think when you start doing your medical school rotations and when you're actually on the floors, you will start seeing, you know, you will see a patient die. You might not, but if you do internal medicine or you do any of the residencies where you're on the floor seeing patients, whether it is surgery or whatever it is, you will come across a patient's death. I believe my first time was in medical school and, you know, I was doing I was doing my internal medicine rotation and there was a code, which is where the patient was coded. You know, they were doing CPR on them. And I remember just being there and, and thinking like, wow, this is just, this is, this is so crazy what's going on. But at the same time, I just really felt for the patient. I felt for like the patient's family and it, and it, and, and I feel like when you're seeing these things, it really just humanizes medicine and makes you realize that you know, part of something that's bigger than you. And, and it's your job to help patients the best you can. So I felt like it impacted me uh, in a positive manner where I actually saw, you know, what this field of medicine actually does and how, and, and, and what our field in general does, you know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so team topics a little bit, what goes into making a prognosis? How do you what factors tell you how long someone has to live? Yeah, that's a great question. So they're definitely all, every disease has a different prognostic, prognostic calculator, I would say, that we use. So for example, if someone has liver disease, there are certain things we look at. We look at your, you know, INR, which is basically telling us, um, the liver makes these clotting factors. And if your liver is not working, these clotting factors can actually increase and it, it prones you to easy bleeding. So we look at the INR to see like if it's high or low, we look at the albumin and we look at all these like medical things that kind of tell us. And, but overall, the most important thing we look at for prognostication is their, um, their physical, basically the physical exam. So, you know, if patient has been walking and talking and able to go on hikes, this patient likely is not going to die in a month. You know, if the patient is actually more bed bound, unable to, you know, has decreased, is not eating as much, um, the patient has decreased activity, uh, then, then we can tell that, okay, based on how long they're in bed, based on how their activity levels have gone down, this is likely how much they have to live. And we're never, you know, we're not God, we're never able to be like, okay, you have now six months, and then you have now five months, and you have three months and two days, because people always get stuck on these numbers. So what we usually do is we kind of tell them broad range, you know, we tell them, you know, I, I, I don't know how long accurately, but, you know, based on people that are usually in your situation and have your lab values, we usually see that these patients last weeks to months or months to years. Um, so it's, it's definitely a broad range that we give. Thank you. Um, because of your role and focus in preventative medicine, do you believe that diet and nutrition should play a bigger role in patient care plans? Definitely. I mean, you know, this is like more on the hospitalist side of things. I always believe diet and nutrition is such a big part of patients care plan. And it's definitely something I feel like is not taught enough in medical schools. Uh, because it's so important to focus on the prevention of things and treating things when they're actually happening and then increasing public awareness of, you know, diet and exercise and things people have to do to live a healthier life is definitely the direction medicine is going in right now. Thank you for giving us some of that insight. Um, you talked a, a little bit earlier about opioids and pain meds, and is it common for you to see patterns of addiction among your patients? Uh, it's, it is not common 
but it does happen. And before we give opioids long-term, we always do some risk assessments to see does this patient have long-term risks of developing opioid dependence. And, and you know, patients that we do give opioids to, we follow them very closely. It's not like we just give them six months of opioids and, and see them six months later. They're, man, you know, they're constantly showing up to the clinic every couple of weeks. Um, we, you know, we do a pill count. We're making sure they're taking the right amount of medications. We're educating them on proper storage and things to do if they start having side effects. Um, so it's never just something we do lightly or take lightly. It's it's a whole process that goes into play. Thank you. Um, so taking gears a little bit again back to kind of applications and medical school experiences, um, somebody was wondering how many medical schools did you apply to? I honestly don't remember the number, but I remember at least interviewing at eight or six. I honestly don't remember, but I'm sure it was as many as possible. <laughs> um, I think some people are very, you know, they, on, they only wanna stay in a certain state. So they only apply to those state schools. Um, I wanted to be very broad. I was very open to going anywhere else. So I applied to a lot more. Um, so I think it all just depends, you know, are you willing to go to certain states to go to medical school there? Is this something that you would like or are you able to? Um, so I don't think there's like a number uh, of how many you can or cannot apply to. And I don't remember how many I applied to, but I think I applied to a pretty good amount because I, I wasn't restricted to a state. Um, kind of following that, did you have a backup plan if you didn't get into med school? And what are your, um, what's your opinion on taking a gap year? Yeah, I think, you know, so uh, before, between undergrad and medical school, I actually took a gap year where I traveled. Um, and I also did some research. And I think gap years are very important if, you know, you are not someone that has everything prepared to apply to medical school, or if you don't get into medical school right away, it's okay to take a year, um, you know, and, and do some research, you know, look for jobs. When I graduated, jobs were just so hard to find. And I was looking for a job and I ended up having a research assistant position um, where I was doing research, stem cell research. And so that was something that helped me uh, but you could be doing other things too. You don't have to do something like stem cell research. You know, you could be doing other types of research or getting involved in other things. And I think that's a very individual decision, but I believe that everyone has a different journey. You don't have to do it right away. You know, a lot of people go into different careers and decide they want to go into medicine. So it's, it's not one size fit all. I'm sorry. I have to um, head out in like a minute. <laughs> That's okay. You can just wrap up and just tell us like if there's any final advice. Um, I think we all learned so much from this session today. So yeah, thank you so much. I know this wasn't an easy topic to discuss. I know these topics are very hard, but I hope it was some education to you about what palliative care and hospice is, what hospitalists do, the type of cases you will see. And, and, and I really hope that if this is a field you want to go into, I hope you pursue it wholeheartedly. Just go for it. You know, we always need more doctors. We need more people that want to help patients. And, and if you do go into it, and if you do get into medical school, that's amazing. I'm wishing you the best of luck and, and just always be really nice and kind to your patients. I think that's like the most important message I always tell everyone, you know, be kind to them. You know, these people really look up to you and, and, and they're looking for you for, you know, with their life in their hands and, and you are their savior. So it's important to be humble and be kind and just kind of really empathize with them. Wonderful, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. It was an amazing presentation and I'm sure our students learned a lot. I'm going to go ahead and direct my students to um, my presentation slides where I'm gonna tell you how you can take the post-shadowing assessment and get your certificate that verifies your hours for today. So what you guys, um, we have a couple um, notifications if you guys missed them at the beginning. Sorry, my computer was over here. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest Thank of your you. evening.
All right, as this loads, thanks for being with me, guys. Um, this is just going to be a reflection slide, so anything that resonated with you for today, go ahead and write that down for yourself. This is going to be super beneficial when you're writing your personal statements and stuff like that. So while these are not mandatory, um, you can turn them into pre-health shadowing if you would like to get published on our official website. So if this is something you are interested in, go ahead and um, click our URL, prehealthshadowing.com slash blog hyphen submissions. You can put this on your applications, your CVs, your resumes, your LinkedIn. Um, you can also submit articles, reviews, and success stories. If you are interested in joining our student team, this is a 100% remote opportunity. Um, this is a leadership position. So if you are interested in meeting with like-minded students, managing projects in different fields, um, definitely sign up for this. You can apply on our website. Of course, uh, this is something that is time consuming. If you do not have um, all the time in the world, but you'd still like to get involved, you can volunteer with Pre-Health Shadowing. You can sign up on our website for this. We have asynchronous and um, hands-on live opportunities for students to work on. So check out our website for more information. This is a QR code that will take you to join our fundraising team. So you can actually get verified virtual volunteering hours for sending out our GoFundMe link. Um, you can track how much money you have raised for pre-health shadowing. Um, those who raise a lot of money um, will be recognized by the National Pre-Health Shadowing Organization. Um, so please ask your families to donate and support your health education. Um, this is a free program. Like we said, we are a student-based, student-led organization, and we rely heavily on our supporters and the community um, to keep our virtual shadowing sessions completely free. By keeping our shadowing sessions completely free, you are helping us fight inequity in health education. Um, so do your part if you are able to. If you are unable to, go ahead and share that link. We appreciate anything you guys are able to do for us. All right, like Dr. Lilani said, getting a mentor is very, very helpful, especially if you are the pre-health student. So we do have a mentorship networking weekend coming up on the weekend of February 19 to 21, where you'll have the opportunity to meet with up to six established professionals in your potential field of interest. Um, this is by invite only. So to gain invitation, you wanna download materials from our Google Drive, post them on your social media. Once your board is all filled up, you can turn it in on our website to receive your RS SVP link. It is that easy indeed. Go ahead and tag us in your posts at prehealth shadowing and use the hashtag prehealth shadowing for um, anything on social media that you do that you want us to know about. Um, this doesn't have to be um, regarding pre-health shadowing. It can be anything cool that you guys are working on. We'd love to hear about it. Go ahead and tag us. We are active on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We have a session coming up tomorrow. Um, you can sign up on our website, prehealthshadowing.com slash sessions. And finally, to take the post-shadowing assessment to get your certificate that verifies your virtual shadowing hours with us today, you are going to go to our website and find Dr. Lalani's course. Once you find her, you're gonna click free, take this course. It'll give you 30 minutes and two tries to complete the post-shadowing assessment. Once you complete it, you can click finish course and you will be able to download your certificate immediately. You can also find your certificate at all times in your profile under the certificates tab. Um, if you guys have any questions about this, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. And thank you again for joining us. This is the end of our virtual shadowing session today. I invite you to disconnect from the call. Hope to see you all tomorrow.